Welcome to another episode of Hashtag Tell Me Your Story. Today we have an incredible guest, Dan Hadley, whose journey spans various landscapes. From a challenging youth to addiction and recovery, Dan's story is nothing short of inspiring. He faced adversity during his early years, navigating between family members in the care system. Dan encountered the alert of hard drugs at a young age, setting the stage for a tumultuous journey. So, welcome Dan. How are you? Yeah, good, not bad, not bad. So we're going to just jump straight in, right? Um, do you want to tell people where you're from? Uh, yes, yeah, so originally from Windsor, despite a, a slight Bromley twang. Um, but, you know, I've been about it, but it's fine. So do you want to take us back to the early years and share some of, of, of what you experienced and, and how you ended up where you are today? Yeah, so um, where do we start? Where do we, I suppose we start at the beginning. That's a good place, isn't it? Um, but yeah, I grew up and, um, you know, I had, had, a, um, I had everything I needed, you know, um, sort of food, clothing and water, lots of love. And, um, you know, mum did the best she could, worked really hard, uh, spent a bit of time living with other family members, um, sort of grandparents. Kind of done the rounds and uh, and you know I was a difficult child um undiagnosed ADHD we didn't know enough about it then you know yeah, so I kind yeah. of missed the boat <laughs> or yeah. the boat hadn't arrived was a better way of putting it yeah I suppose because um, I suppose a lot of us are the same around our age aren't we like we missed out on them diagnosis when we were younger and I suppose moving around was quite difficult so that would have added to any symptoms to ADHD as well wouldn't it yeah, and, and uh, you know, I was, I was definitely loved enough, um, and, and I think it's important to say that, you know, my, what was, wasn't met was my expectation, but that would have never been met, you know, and I think we spoke, you know, before the podcast, and had I been grown up in a, you know, with lots of money, you know, a big house, and all the kind of, the grown up upper class, shall we say, um, you know, my, my expectation would have still never been met. You know, my mum um, loved me, you know, and my, and my dad, you know, loved me in their own way. And um, I suppose you can only work with the tools you're given. So, you know, they were dealing with their own stuff at the same time. Um, but I think it's important to say that I was loved, definitely loved as a child. You know, I've got a sister and, and she was loved. And, you know, we come from a um, working class family. Uh, dad was a builder. Mum was, um, well, she, you know, she did very well. She, she's a registered CQC manager. Um, it's just a worked... family having like normal troubles. The love was there and everything. It's just yeah. Yeah. shit happens, isn't it? Like, yeah. Uh, picked up. Um, I, I went, yeah, I went into the care system. Picked up cannabis at a young age, probably maybe eleven, twelve. Definitely twelve. Progressed. Um, Progressed onto hard drugs quite quickly. Probably 12, 13, maybe when I was messing around with crack and cocaine, definitely. Uh, and then crack cocaine and, and, and then heroin by about 14. Wow, so that is really young for them type of drugs, isn't it? Yeah. So when you were in the care home, was was it in when you were in that system that you come across these drugs and like people who introduced you to them or was it on the street or no it wasn't it wasn't care home you know I was selling drugs from a young age um you know at care home there was this there was this unity you know and uh, as in any care home there is a, a degree of um abuse you know physical abuse um I, I no doubt some other stuff but you know I wasn't I wasn't exposed to that you know, and you know, it was just togetherness that we were we were definitely a pack. And um <clears throat> trauma bonding, isn't it? So absolutely. So you twelve so what did you say, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, you're into these hard drugs? Like where did it go from there then? You were were you just dabbling at that age or were you were you selling and then smoking a bit or did it just like really rapidly get out of control or yeah, I was selling cannabis and cocaine and, and kind of just taking the, the class A, the hard class A's, um, the crack cocaine, 
you know, there was a few of us in our circle that were kind of moving in that direction. And, um, and uh, yeah, I didn't really progress to sell that until, until I was a lot older. Um, but yeah, and, and, and then the party scene, you know, we were out clubbing at sort of 15, 16 and, and taking ecstasy and, um, and just kind of uh, just finding our way, you know. Um, it's very escape really, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. We just wanted to grow up. <laughs> yeah, I remember yeah. them days of clubbing. I think I was 14 as well, 14, 15, hitting the clubs with my older cousin and first experience in E. I thought I was so grown up and so adult in it. Yeah. <laughs> Loved it, I did. But you don't realise what you're getting yourself into, do you, when you're taking them drugs at such a young age? No, no. You, you know, like it, had they told me where it would end, do you think you would have <laughs> probably would have still done it? I know, isn't it? Like you don't, you nobody learns by hindsight. They learn by making mistakes, you know. And I suppose we probably have them types of personalities that, you know, are, are addictive personalities. So when we went down this route of discovery with drugs, like most kids do, it sort of took us to a different place because of probably trauma and whatever type of personality we had. You know, it's different for us, isn't it? Yeah, well, well, the mentality of of of, of my, definitely myself. But I can only speak from my own experience. Is um, I'm special. I'm different. That won't happen to me. And I'm sure other addicts can identify with that that kind of mentality. Definitely. So yeah, you know, and uh, I tried to prove that point for about 23 years, and and and, uh, and gave it up in the end. So. 23 years you were on drugs so what where's what sort of places did that take you like oh wow where did it take me um i suppose uh i think the focus really for me is um is where did it take me in my mind you know what sort of person did it turn me into um so there was there's the obvious stuff stripped the weight off me i think by the time i went to uh, the last rehab i was about 12 stone um Abscesses, DVTs, um, yeah, high amount of dependency, you know, normal kind of methadone program, 70 mils of methadone, about 100 pounds worth of heroin and crack cocaine a day, uh, intravenous injecting into my groin, which is where I ended up, um, possibly looking at a possible leg amputation. Yeah, the last year of, of, of real, you know, hard dependent using, um, I was in hospital about five times. Wow. Pleurisy, septicemia, multiple DVTs, um, abscesses. I was just done, man. I was just broke. Yes, yeah, so you just like went all out and took it to the extremes. Yeah. And I suppose that's where most people do end up going, isn't it, with this these types of drugs? Yeah, but I remember on the crack, I went on to 11 stone. Like there was nothing left of me. And now I'm age 11 clothes. I mean, not 11 stone. Sorry. I'm 13 stone now, but I'm five foot 10. Do you know what I mean? So I've always yeah. had, an os- I'm not skinny. I've never been a skinny girl. So be- me wearing age 11 jeans and tracksuit bottoms underneath, like I was wrote off as well. Do you know what I mean? That was from smoking crack. Never mind the rest of what you was doing as well with the yeah. heroin and like that's double trouble, isn't it? Like, ugh. yeah, I, I think you know for me, uh, snowballs, you know, they were like a whole new, whole new drug. And, and um, that's it. And I've never, I never really, I done, I done a snowball once or twice. Um, I tried it, but it was not something that I did because I think heroin was. I only used that after. Do you know what I mean? The crack this time. I had a heroin addiction years ago, but this last one that I went through in 2018, I got clean since. I just used the the heroin after, but I, it still gave me a habit, obviously. But it just it 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 just destroyed me. The crack did, and I can only imagine going full out on them both. What well, extreme it would take you to? Like it's crazy, isn't it? Yeah, I think you know physically. Um... My experience has been that I get that back quite quick. You know, the weight yeah. comes back on, the DVTs, the abscesses, they go. Um, where, where the damage is, is, has been done is is mentally. So through that last year, that last 12 months when you were in and out of hospital, like how was your mental health and, you know, how did it deteriorate? Um, and 
you know, funny enough, it's um, a bit madder now. I'm not using, and substances covered all that up. Covered I suppose up. ADHD way in, in them sort of symptoms, is that what you mean? Uh, yeah, yeah, the ADHD, but, you, you know, just the, um, say trauma, I don't like to use that too much, but definitely the, yeah, yeah it's trauma, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And, and trauma has similar symptoms to ADHD as well. So having both of them, trauma and ADHD, only heightens the symptoms, doesn't it? So I bet you're like a little jack in the box now, are you with nothing to bring you down? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, you know, I, I just, um, it's, it's like a committee in my head, you know, that, that's kind of what I live with. Um, sometimes it's, it, it, it's comical. Um, some days are darker than others, you know, today, today's been a particularly dark day. Yeah. And um, where do I go with that? How do I deal with it? I've got I've got a good support network. I've got good people around me. Um, and, I, and I try and look inwards. You know, that's and that's difficult, man, because you know there's lots of stuff that gets in the way of that. Yeah. Faith's important. Sorry. Faith's really important. Were you religious before you were? Uh, when you went uh, on drugs or before drugs? You know, I just. I always knew there was something there, you know. Yeah. Um, and how do I describe that? That there was just a feeling that you know what everything was going to be all right. Sometimes I used on that, you know, because I was like, you know, just but, but you know, uh, sometimes I just took it to the extreme because I just thought, man, I'll be all right, I'll be all right. Maybe that was an excuse. Um, because what I come to realise later on was actually everything was going to be all right, but I had to put the work in. Yes, hundred percent, definitely. So could you share a pivotal moment or an experience that made you realise you needed to change your life? Just got sick of sick of going to rehab. <laughs> How many times did you go in total? Did you five, say? five rehabs in total. Um, wow. And the last one that really done the work and it doesn't uh, it doesn't mean the job was finished because there was, you know, I still bang my head after yeah. that. I still make mistakes. I still have to, um, I still really have to look at myself. Um, well, it's not a journey that ever ends, really, is it? No. I guess something that you have to repeat every day and you have to make that decision every day yeah. to stay in recovery, isn't it? So it's not something you can take lightly. No, and that, they all played a part. You know, I did uh, I did kind of a TC, like a therapeutic community. That was the first one. And, and I was 27 and didn't, no, I, I just didn't get it. Why can't, why can't I smoke weed? I just wanted to get off her and, um, yeah. you know, very naive. And then I did uh, a Christian treatment centre. Uh, I did that three times. Um, and, and what did I learn from that? That I could get I could get days clean. Yeah. And, and I learned about God and, and I learned about faith. And um, you know, I learned about that. I suppose when do, when 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 do I kind of turn to God when my back's against the wall? I should I should do it a bit sooner, really. And I, on occasions I do, you know, if I'm walking to work and I'm having a bit of a bad day, I'll just have a little bit of a prayer and stuff works there. Yeah. Last one was, um, and I'm going to name them because they, they deserve the accolade, uh, it was a 12-step treatment centre, uh, Jericho House in Derby. And, um, you know, these guys aren't, you know, they're, they're, they don't sing about what they do. They, you know, they're not jumping up and down. They're not looking for any sort of, um, any sort of uh, what would be the word attraction rather than promotion would, would be yeah. the word, and um, they just broke me, man, in a good way. I needed breaking. Yes, definitely. That's what I had to do in my recovery. I had to really build myself up from scratch and and find out who you have to go on that self discovery avenue. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I, I suppose with you being in a place like that, you have all these people who are experienced in it and know how to bring it out of you and know how to do it properly then isn't it? yeah and what did they do so you know they didn't uh you know the job wasn't done when i left but what they did was they gave me the tools and um and, and the direction you know where to look to finish the job and or well if there is such a thing where to look to, to continue doing the work yeah that was probably you know those sort of seven months i spent in there um that was what i got from that is you know it, it, you know how free do you want to be it, 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 it was it was the term sort of thrown around by the manager so when you went into rehab what was so you said you were in there seven months 
What was it like when you came back out? Um, oh, it was just like, yeah, it was just overwhelming. It it but you know, they, they have a, re, a really good reintegration process. I okay. went to a dry house afterwards, spent some time in aftercare around the treatment centre, um, and, and then wanted to go in, in my own direction, you know, because that's just my nature, you know, and I won't be told. Yes. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> you know, kind of what you can't hear, I have to feel. You know, Definitely. And, so, so what was, um, after this transformation, um you became involved in volunteering so what inspired you to make this change then after your recovery and how did it shape your perspective on helping others uh yeah so i did some volunteering work i did uh, like an outreach kind of feeding the homeless thing um mainly out of boredom really because you know i was in birmingham um I, I went to a dry house in birmingham i stayed there for a little while moved on to um eventually you're after a you know, some, uh, how do I put this, um, you know, after some mistakes, you know, yeah. um, you know, I ended up facilitating or volunteering, I co facilitating group work. Um, so I was doing that, I was doing the outreach, you know, feeding um, people that were sleeping rough, and then I was doing uh, some volunteering with the Hep C Trust. Wow, so how did you find that? How did you manage, like, was it that through the hostels that you were living in that you managed to get into this kind of work? Or yeah, was... yes. Yeah. So what was it like? How did you enjoy that? Like, how did it shape your perspective going forward then? Did it give you motivation and name to move forward? Yeah, it kept me busy, kept me busy, you know, which which was the main thing, because, you know, I like to be busy. I like to have a project to work on. Um, alongside that, I was doing a uh, counselling qualification, which is what I wanted to do. Wow. Um, so I was busy, you know, and... But still, still learning about me, my behaviour around, you know, I have to be honest, my behaviour around three months was terrible. Yeah. And I have some good people that I check in with. I have um, a female that I check in with my behaviour, you know, and she tells me straight and, and she says, no, that's not good what you've done. Or she, she just tells me straight and I have a good, um, good, strong male role models, which I've not had before up until going into treatment. So, so I knew that that was important. People that would tell me how it is. Yeah, and it, it is true that it's, you've got to surround yourself with the right type of people, haven't you, when you leave that life? Like, it's so important because I suppose you started on drugs at a very early age. And I believe that when you end up in addiction, it's like you stop growing there and then like when you go into addiction you stop learning all the life's lessons yeah. you stop maturing so you end up on drugs for years and years and years and it's like you still feel in your head that you're very young but years have passed and it's like you don't fit together do you know what I mean you, you've missed out on so much and when you come off drugs then you've got to relearn everything again and like you're a child like you've gone back loads of years till you're a teenager or whatever year you started and it's crazy that you've got to, you you've just stopped aging, stopped maturing, not aging, sorry, but maturing, yeah. and you don't like learn nothing in them years. And it's crazy, isn't it? Except for the street stuff that you do actually learn and and crime and whatever way. But it's mad, like the mental side of it. I I look back at myself now, and I'm very disconnected to that person who was on drugs. It feels like I have somebody else's memories in my head because the person I am today can't relate to the person I was when I was on drugs and the things that I did. I don't know whether it's like a block my own mind have put on it, but it, it's crazy to me that looking back today, I think, how did I ever do that? Or how did I ever live like that? And do you feel like that with when you look back on them times? Uh, I certainly um, I certainly became aware quite quickly. Um, and, and looking back now, uh, you know, and I'll say this to people I work with, you know, when you put drugs down, what you're going to be left with is the person that picked them up. You know, and, um, that's very much the case. And you have to grow up fast. Yeah, definitely. And progress, you know, because if, if you're not moving forward, you're going to regress. And um, going backwards, you're not that much longer. Yeah, well, boredom is, is a huge trigger, isn't it, for people who are coming off drugs? Like, your life has been so chaotic for so long, and then you stop taking drugs, and it's like nothing is happening in your life. So if you don't fill that void with something, you're just going to end up back, going back to that behaviour that you've always known, aren't you? Yeah, and you know this, Dan, using is a full-time job. Yeah. 
Definitely. Like you're fairly busy. You're fairly busy all the yeah. time, you know, and and uh, you know you're out there grafting and you're making hundred quid a day in my case. You know, and then you're dodging the police, and then you, you know, you're getting your drugs, and it's, it's a full, it's a full time job in itself. And, yeah. um, and then there's the mental stuff. You know, your head's, your head's busy. Yeah, definitely, it's crazy, isn't it? So when you started volunteering, then when did you like take? You said you were doing the counselling course. When did you take the leap into employment? I did voluntary for a couple of years, and. Um, then I uh, I came home because of, of some stuff around my children, you know, it was, uh, some, some personal stuff around my kids. And uh, so I moved home and then I started working for a fairly well-known organisation. I won't name them, but, but uh, I started doing outreach work. And, and what did that look like? That was getting people that were um, like street pot, uh, getting on script, hard to reach clients. Wow. And so substance misuse you were in then, yeah? Yeah, I worked in substance misuse, yeah, so it started with outreach. Um, and what, you know, I love that work because, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't too far from where they were. Yeah, so and it, was... it makes a difference, doesn't it? Like yeah. the connection that you can make with them. But did you find that difficult because you were so early on, on in your journey? No, nah, you know, drugs doesn't, uh, if, you know, I come to realise that if, if, if I've picked up drugs, I've missed the trick <laughs> or two. Yeah. You know, my, my, my relapses have started way, way back. Um, so I'm, I'm OK around people using. I mean, I'm, it doesn't mean I'm going to go and sit in a crack house. Yeah, of um, course. <laughs> that would just be stupid. Um, <laughs> but it means that, you know, I kind of get it. And I, and I see, you know, when I, when I work with people that use them, I, I kind of see past and see a lot of potential. Uh, because I knew I had potential myself. You know, so, um, it's the magic of lived experience, isn't it? Um, yeah. And it's nice. Because I, I see myself as a professional with lived expertise, and I suppose you do as well. Now, you've done a lot of training, do you know what I mean? As well as having the lived experience to go with the academic training you've had, isn't it? So I see peers and volunteers. I say they're, they're people with lived experience in the workplace, and then I call myself a professional with lived expertise, and I'm trying to spread it around to everybody because I see it very tokenistic sometimes when people with lived experience are employed and sometimes they can be used to you know be in the spotlight and tell their story like I've always told my story I've never been used I'm very vocal about my story and I'm happy to share it but there's a lot of people out there that get pressured into telling their story and being the face for some organizations and I think we need to be start seeing as professionals first because we do all the training when we get employed we're fully trained for the job we just have that extra added flavour of having some lived experience to understand the clients that we're working with. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, uh, you know, I've worked with academics and, and they definitely have a place. Oh, yes. uh, I think oh, lived, ex lived experience has a place. Um, you know, and, and I'm not sure how, how long you, your kind of own journey was, but, you know, I kind of look at it and think, well, I've done a 23 year degree in substance misuse, yeah. you know. And um, so I know, I know, I know a little bit about a little bit. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't, you know. So, so where does that fit in? It means, you know, in order to communicate with people, you know, and certainly the level I'm kind of working at at the minute, I have to, I have to leave that there. That's that's for, for me and the client. And then, and then I have to learn how to communicate with professionals. And that's not in a way I would communicate with a client. You know, that's, yeah, that's a yeah I different. think that was one of the biggest challenges I had when I first went back to work is communicating in a professional way. Like, because I've been on the street for so long, if I had an issue, it would be like, oi, like, you know what I mean? And it'd come out. <laughs> when you go into work, you've got to, like, it's a shock to the system. It was a shock to the system for me. And it took me a while to learn, you know, that professionalism and, leaving that bit of that streak behind you don't need that you only need to bring little bits in with you from your experience you know and it's about growing isn't it and you know that that street bit only becomes a little bit of your story then not just part, not not what defines you yeah absolutely and um and again you know different hats with different roles you know yeah. it depends on on who i'm working with i'm working with clients you know i notice my the, the, the dialects i use will change slightly and um you know, I'm I'm happy to share my experience, you know, and I don't shy away from that. And um, but what I do have to remember is that when I'm sharing my experience, 
it's about me then and it's not about the client. So I have to limit that and allow space for the client to, to share their experience. Yes, definitely. So have you always worked in substance misuse um, or have you done a bit in the criminal justice sector? Or? Yeah, so I moved over to uh, criminal justice, uh, did outreach for about a year, moved over to criminal justice and um, done that for a couple of years. Because what I realised is as well as substance misuse, I had all this knowledge around the criminal justice sector. Um, so I, did, I was a uh, prison inmates lead uh, at Reading um, for a while. So that was uh, oh, there was you know, a few different elements to the role. Um, but I was really a, a massive advocate of getting guys into, into rehab. Um, because it worked for me yeah definitely it does work isn't it especially if you if you can catch them people in the right mindset at the right time and if somebody's like you is in a place like that then you're able to do that and get them on that journey to rehab because there's no prison officers that are going to be pushing people to go to rehab or you know what I mean it needs people like yourself being in these places to make a difference because you can see the passion coming through and your experience is coming through then yeah, I'm. I'm like, send everyone to rehab. Just send everyone. Just because we all got behaviours, you know. Uh, send, yeah. send, send the kids. Send the missus. Send everyone to rehab. Um, you know, we've all got behaviours we need to work on. Um, you know, uh, substance misuse can be dealt with in two weeks. <laughs> you can do a detox in a couple of weeks if you just get into it and get out of it. Um, and, and that was my experience. There was no, there was no OST. The day I got to treatment was the day I finished. I finished my methadone. Yeah. And um, I had to feel that rattle, you know. I had to yeah. feel it, you know, and, and just and just as a, as a reminder of what I'm capable, left to my own devices, what I'm capable of doing to myself. Yeah, and it is that um, the worst experience that you'll ever go through is doing that rattle in it. Well, I don't know. <laughs> oh, no, no, I couldn't handle it. I couldn't. I don't know what it is, but I think it's, they say it's worse for women. I don't know whether it is because I'm never. i not a man. I never felt it. But I couldn't handle it. I couldn't. I, I had to go on to methadone and totally come down like really slow because I could not feel. I could feel a little bit, but when it got into the, pro I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it at all. I would have given up if I ever had to do cold turkey. I wouldn't. If that was the only way to get off it, I would still be on it because I couldn't do it. I was I was really lucky, you know. And, and Jericho, the, the three percent I went to, the guys there, man, you know, the residents, uh, they just wrapped me up. You know, these guys they ran me hot baths. Ah. Um, you know, if I needed it, they would help me get in and out of the bath. Yes. You know, That's they they. They sat up with me at night when I couldn't sleep. Where you know, um, they they made me cups of tea, cups of coffee. Uh, they listened to me. It was fairly annoying. <laughs> yeah. You know, they they let me be annoying. You know, I was just an annoying person. Um, you know, that obsessive madness that I, I, it just my head had to go somewhere. You know, and um, yeah, you know, the, uh, maybe I was lucky. The rattle wasn't too bad. Uh, you know, the, the, well, you may have just had the right mindset to go through, wasn't it? Maybe I just didn't, and that was another thing that was keeping me on the drugs. Yeah, yeah. I think I see guys rattling, and I, and, and I don't say it. But what I want to say is just wait, wait till your head kicks in and the fun really begins. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely. Yeah. So you have worked in the criminal justice system, which is a unique path. How did your personal experiences and journey influence your approach to helping others within the system? You said all about sending them to rehab, but what sort of other work did you do while you were in there? Yeah, so I've done some other work, guys, get, getting guys back into employment. And, and, you know, what I've come to learn is that rehab, some guys just they don't want to do it. So, you know, reducing them slowly in the community. Yes. Um, you know, I've worked with uh, guys from different cultures. Um, and, and that's broke down some of my own barriers. Oh, that's good. You know, and, and um, you know, working with guys from, from uh, Jamaican, or African, uh, Caribbean heritage. Oh, yeah, you get to learn all about their culture and the different reasons behind like what they experience and stuff. It's, it's I suppose it would open your eyes to a, a whole total different culture of, of addiction and stuff when it's from a different person's perspective, especially someone from a different culture. Yeah, uh, do you know do you know what? So there's that that's really obvious stuff, but what it's done for me, um, you know, and what I'm talking about is my own core belief system. And and, and I'll touch on it, it's a touchy subject, but that. I'm different to them, and what I've come to realise is that actually not. Well, that's that's 
that's self-realization I suppose and self-discovery isn't it and yeah. you're just learning and opening your mind up and noticing those um what what do you call them um bias and you know unconscious bias yeah. and and once you do notice them then you do do something about it so that's a good thing that's a positive thing yeah and um yeah I, i've just learned so much and, and i work i work with um uh, guys you know from, and, and ladies from similar culture and uh, you know i'm just it's just opened my mind up to a whole other yeah just a whole other side to me that i didn't know was there and um and, and not a healthy side either you know not definitely not a healthy side you know and you know beliefs that i didn't even realize that were there that i just bought into um you know from generation to generation um and, and it's really just broke those barriers down you know amazing you know. isn't it when you educate yourself yeah yeah what, what you how you can change and flourish and grow into a better person like when people don't realize that you know take some time and and you know, find out some some you know about any culture that you have some sort of feeling about, and you will realise that we're all the same. We're just from you know we have we different. We live we might live diff, slightly differently, or you know believe in what we call different gods or whatever. You know what I mean? But we're all human. Absolutely, and that's it, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. But for you to be able to recognise that in yourself, and then do that job and then realize and, and then you know notice the unconscious biases you had like that's a huge achievement because there's not a lot of people who would actually sit there and admit that in the first place anyway but even then to do something about it and address it and then realize that oh my god I've just found another whole you know load of information about other cultures that you're really enjoying and you probably would never have ever thought that you would enjoy learning about other cultures and and meeting people from other cultures so that's an that's an amazing thing in itself yeah just you know just a massive especially the last five six months just a massive journey of of, of self-discovery and you know they say they say god moves in in, in mysterious ways and uh and i genuinely believe that you know i'm placed in a position in i'm working in a, in a borough that is predominantly uh men from african and caribbean and you know parts of the world and um you know being placed in in, in that you know in that part of london as um is not you know i didn't expect to get what i've got out of uh, being there and um and i've got much more you know uh, much more uh, working in that area and so after the criminal justice system then like are you still in the criminal justice system now or what you do in where did you go from there yeah, so I'm uh, still working in criminal justice. I've just got a position as a service user involvement lead. Um, oh, on. yeah. So yeah, back to back to working with clients, you know, but um, you know, and, and implementing a, a service user involvement. I suppose it, it isn't there at the minute. The service I'm working on, or it is there, but it's just the kind of bones of it. But, but we're gonna, you know, we're gonna get that up and running, and giving a service user a voice got some some other uh, projects that I'm, I'm working on that are kind of personal and, and, and my own stuff and uh, you know, I hope to hopefully see where that goes. Yeah. You mentioned your upcoming podcast. Can you give us a sneak peek into the topics you plan to explore and what inspired you to start this venture? Yeah, um, or what inspired me? So I realised, um, so, OK, so let's start with the podcast. So, yeah, I'm looking at launching a podcast. Um, and looking at a number of social issues and and, and, and not just you know, we're not talking about well we are we're talking about housing addiction and mental health but but we, i want to ask the questions that people aren't asking yeah and um we're looking at some other stuff around faith and uh racism systemic racism wow. so uh Good. covert, covert racism then. yeah you know um i don't mind asking the questions you know i don't mind and so yeah, and again, you know, this is stuff that I'm, 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 I'm kind of, uh, you know, that that sort of subject came about in the because of the area I work in, and I kind of realised actually, you know, what there's, um, there's such a thing as white privilege. Yeah, definitely. And and my experience of that goes goes back to my my last prison sentence. So uh, my last prison sentence, I was 
uh, caught with a, an amount of drugs and uh, I was uh, the, uh, yeah, there was another guy on the prison sentence, a guy for he's Asian, and um, we've been our, our cases were identical. Aye. Uh, same amount of drugs divided up into the same amount of shots, uh, same weight, same you know, same amount of crack, same amount of heroin, and um, I got two years and he got six. Wow. Did he have much more previous than you, or is there any other mitigating factors that would have made him get that six, or was it just purely it was identical? You had similar backgrounds, and it was just because I do I've seen it happen. My brother mm. is I'm Indian family. My brother's dark skin, so I've watched it firsthand yeah. my whole life. But just to explain for like the viewers, just so nobody can say, oh, there could be this and that. Like, what was your experience? Did you have similar backgrounds? And uh, absolutely, uh, you know, they, they, you know. So that, that's a really good question. The, what were the back, You know, what were the pre 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 cons? We would call them. Um, I know I was on my third strike for possession with a So given the given the climate at the time, I should have been IPP. Yeah. yeah. And I wasn't. You know, I, I should. You know, I should have done longer than. What did I do in the end? Probably a year. Is that? And do you um, think that had you being from where you were from, from Windsor, and being from a middle class, a working class, middle class family, that that was made the difference in your sentence compared to his? You know, those, those are contributing factors. Um, you know, and 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 we can, we can kind of turn up on court and and, and put put our best foot forward. Um, I don't think the difference should be four years. No, not for exactly the same no, crime. It's just no. crazy, isn't it? So maybe, a, maybe a year, maybe a two years at a push, but 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 definitely not four years. And um, I thought I put my foot in it when I said that to him, you know, because he said to me, "Why do you think that is?" And uh, I was stood on the wing, and I, you know, I was twelve stone, I'm emaciated, heroin addict, so <laughs> wasn't a big guy, you know, and and. Uh, Definitely didn't have any confidence. Uh, and when I said that, when he said to me, "What? Well, how come do you think that is? And uh, I opened my mouth without thinking. But what I said at the time was was quite poignant, you know, and I said, because I'm white and you're Asian. Okay. And uh, the look on his face was like, I was like, shit, I'm in trouble. <laughs> and, then, and then he paused for a second and looked at me and said, uh, you're right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, yeah. Uh, so, so, so yeah, just to go back to the original question, that's the sort of stuff I want to be challenging. Um, and then we're doing another one on ADHD. Uh, so ADHD is very complex. And, and, you know, if you read a book on ADHD, you probably won't finish the book. I've got a guy coming on. He's just going to give it to us in real layman's terms, you know, one person to another. And, and you know, so that's important. Yes, definitely. Um, I will definitely be keeping my eye out for this. So, have you got a name for this podcast yet? Yeah, so it's called uh, The People I Know. Um, I know. You know. It's fairly simple. Uh, yeah. and, you know, so uh, the PIC is, 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 is uh, an abbreviation for that. Right. So, uh, a- all, acronym, all acronym. my subscribers now, you have to keep an eye out for this and I will share it when it's out. So, keep an eye out because I reckon this is going to be good too. <laughs> So in our conversation before, you've mentioned that you've wanted to open like your own type of recovery homes um, in the future. Is that something that is still on the cards for you or have you, you know, is that the, the direction you're going in? Uh, it's definitely something. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's um, there's a there's a, a definitely a need for young men and young women coming out of prison and um, need a, a sustainable you know, accommodation, but but we're not just talking about uh, putting people in beds and th- and there you go. So you know that would come with um, a, a program, and uh, we you know pro social modelling in terms of we would offer a good recovery model, and, and that's definitely a dream for the future. Um, you know that's that that's the five year plan. I love it. I love it though. Like when like people like us who have been through not just like addiction, but anyone prison or and then when they turn their lives around, they have a passion to help other people and that empathy that's there because we know what people are experiencing and we also have some knowledge of you know how to navigate out of that lifestyle and for us to want to go back in and give back to others. There's a lot of people that go through recovery and don't. Do you know what I mean? So there's not. There's not as many people that go into the work like you've gone into and being successful in it and really have a passion in it and want to go on 
and open your own recovery centers and do the stuff you're doing like with the podcast and it's just amazing to see so what so what advice would you give to someone who might be facing similar challenges um or you know on a similar path to you did like is there any advice that you would give people out there today yeah um just keep coming back <laughs> just, just, just keep coming keep turning up you know uh take a fall if you need to and uh, and get back up and have another go um you know don't don't uh don't look at your your, uh, your slips as as failures but but definitely lessons what can i learn from this experience you know if you if you bang your head or you, or, or you get knocked back you know just 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 get back up and have another go it is isn't it that's what i say it's a journey you go on and every if you fall down it's just you learn from what you did what what the mistake was what made you fall and then the next time you can put tools in place to prevent that happening if something else happens you put tools to prevent that in happening and you just keep moving forwards and each time you're just learning more tools and more skills to keep going on in your recovery and then one day it just all clicks some people get it on their first or second time some people get it on their 22nd time yeah. do you know what i mean but it's not it's not a one shoe fits all is it no and i, and I think it's important to highlight that you know uh when i say sort of fall down well, i'm not just talking about substances yeah. Um, I'm, relationships man they, you know they teach me so much about me um and, and not just intimate relationships relationships with my family relationships with my children um uh, relationship with myself yeah no, that's 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 the one isn't it? And i think it takes a long time to forgive yourself doesn't it like for the mistakes you made and you know whatever situation you ended up with in your families because People who go through addiction usually have a very rocky road during that that addiction as well. Do you know what I mean? And make a lot of mistakes, and it's it's hard to face all that, isn't it? Yeah, I, and you know, I heard this. For, I heard this for about three years, and people said, "Get a relationship with yourself. Get a relationship with yourself." I just heard it, heard it, and over and over again. Uh, and um, I said, I said to one of my friends, uh, "Yeah, she's um, absolute staunch lady," and uh, I just I was so pissed off with hearing it. I said, uh, what does that even mean? And um, she just put it really simply and she said, just noticing yourself, good and bad. Yeah. I was like, okay, cool. I can, do, you know, a light bulb moment. You know, I, I definitely notice myself, but, you know, in them bad times because I'm, I'm whipping myself for it all the time, you know, and, um, you know, so noticing myself in them bad times, okay, what's that coming up with? You know, uh, for me, trauma is, is, is not a new thing. Um, my trauma just represents you know my trauma is uh me five years old um you know maybe some abandonment in there some rejection in there i don't know you know i don't want to call people out where that relates to you know it's not important but what it does is it represents dressed up as something else it represents um uh, you know in, in a new relationship for example you know being abandoned being rejected and it's just it's just the same trauma that's 35 years it's old. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I, I suppose that's what people need to understand about trauma is sometimes you can do all the counselling in the world, but it will still resurface um, and there's nothing you could do about it. And I suppose that's the same with, I suppose, some people who are in recovery and they get the urge every now and again, even out of the blue when you haven't been on it for years. Do you know what I mean? And these these feelings you've got to constantly deal with all the time, isn't it? Of resurfacing trauma, of of your past life, whatever. And it, it's hard to maintain that recovery then, isn't it? When when they're popping up all the time. But that's what's so important about lo- learning them tools along the way. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And and you know, the, in comes that the realization it's not about drugs. Yeah, it's never been about drugs. You know. You know, drugs drugs were my solution. Yeah. You know, and they worked until they didn't work. And um, it's definitely about behaviours. Um, so it's been amazing having you on the show, Dan. And thank you for being so honest about your, your journey, because I think it's very important that people like us speak out about what we experience and, you know, letting the world know what we're doing today. So just thank you very much for being on the show and sharing with us. No, thanks for having me. Uh, it's been a pleasure, and uh, I, you know, I know you're doing well, and I, I wish you all the best for the future of the podcast. No problem. When you release that first episode, now share it over, and I'll make sure I share it as well. I'm looking forward to watching.
No, I appreciate that. Appreciate that. So I'd just like to thank all my viewers and subscribers for tuning in and we will catch you on another episode of Hashtag Tell Me Your Story.